Hello and welcome back to the next episode of the Binko Gambit speedrun series here. In this episode, we are in episode number 6. We're playing against players in the rating range of 1100 to 1200 in the rapid rating pool on chess.com. Here, we're going to have three different games where we get to play against uh, White, who is going for, in one of the games, the Black Merdeemer Gambit. So we'll see how to play against that and punish it. We're also going to see examples where our opponent uh, captures a pawn on c5, we're able to regain the pawn, get a bit of a space advantage in the center of the board, and play around the center of the board very well. And uh, we are going to be punishing our opponent's mistakes, taking advantage of the inaccuracies that they go for, and then getting good positions out of the opening and ultimately winning these games. So let's go ahead and get right into the first game. Without further ado, let's start. All right, so we've got our first game here. Against the move d4, we're going for knight f6. We're playing against Philip, uh, Philippus, 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 <laughs> uh, rated 1132 from Sweden, it looks like. So d4, knight f6, they go for c4. We're going for c5 for uh, the start of our bingo gambit. We'll see if white plays the move d5 or if they play a different move here instead. d5 is definitely white's best move. Uh, objectively speaking, in the position, but there's many people, as we've seen throughout the speedrun series, who don't play the move d5 and don't go into a uh, proper bingo gambit. If they do play d5, we'll go for b5. If they go for the move knight f3, uh, this is another option that is very solid for white, uh, but it's not terribly ambitious is the drawback for the, uh, from their point of view. So what I recommend against this is going ahead and exchanging the pair of pawns. White will usually recapture with the knight, if they recapture with the queen, we're pretty happy to develop our knight and attack the queen in the center of the board. Instead, they recapture with the knight. And there's many different ways to play this position. Uh, knight to c6 is a good move. Pawn to g6 is possible. Uh, what I recommend playing here is the move pawn to e6. And the idea is to play a very quick pawn to d5 idea. So against most options that white will play on move number five, we will go for the move pawn to d5. Now here, white decides to go for the move bishop to g5. They are pinning our uh, queen in this position here. And against this particular option, uh, I don't think this is that great of a move for our opponent. I have a feeling that we can do something like queen to a5 check. And then depending on how white blocks the check, we might be able to... Well, first of all, we're attacking the bishop. So if we check here and the knight blocks, we can simply take the bishop on g5. If the queen blocks on d2, we can play bishop to b4, which becomes very annoying for our opponent. And if they instead bring the bishop back to the d2 square, uh, then we can play something maybe like queen back to b6 or bishop up to b4. And I don't really think that this setup for white with their bishop moving back and forth is really all that great for them. We could begin with the bishop check first. This is also possible. Um, and if white plays knight c3, then we still play a move like queen a5, and white might still be in a little bit of a tricky spot. But I'm going to start with the move queen a5 check. I'm assuming my opponent will block with the queen or with the bishop. If they do block with the knight, we will pick up the bishop on g5 for free. But it would definitely be better for them to block with the bishop or the queen. I do think blocking with the bishop is the best move. Instead, though, they decide to play the move queen d2, which does block the check and also defend the bishop. And it also counterattacks our queen. So we can't do something like knight to e4 because we would lose our queen on a5. Uh, that being said, what we can do in this position is we can make the move bishop to b4, pinning the queen with our bishop. It is not winning the queen just yet because white could play the move knight to c3 to, uh, to block off the pin. Uh, but the problem is after they play knight to c3, then we can play the move knight to e4, and this is going to be a huge problem for our opponent the knight on c3 will be attacked and uh, piled up on. We'll also be attacking the bishop on g5, the queen on d2, and white's actually going to be in very bad shape here very quickly. So this bishop g5 move I don't think is a great move for, from our opponent, but they really should have brought the bishop back to d2. That would have been a safe and solid way of playing. Against this, though, knight to e4 looks to be pretty killer. Our opponent plays the move knight back to b3. Uh, which does counterattack our queen on a5. So if we take their queen, they're going to get our queen. That's that's their idea, as far as I can tell. Uh, the downside to this, as far as I can see, though, is I think we can just take the bishop on g5. We are attacking it two different times with our bishop and our queen. Uh, if they trade queens, we take back. We're up a piece. That's great. And if they try to take our queen or try to take our knight, then that is going to open up the attack from our bishop because the knight on c3 is currently pinned. 
So let's just go ahead and take on g5 here. I think it was also possible to take on d2, and then once white took our queen, retreat the knight. I think that would have also worked too. Uh, but here we can simply uh, take back on g5. We could also throw in the move bishop takes c3 with check if we wanted to. Uh, might be useful just to you know take the knight and mess up our opponent's pawns. Um, but I'm just going to take back with the knight. I think we'll just keep it simple here. And this knight is not really ever going to be trapped. It can always come back to the e4 square because the knight on c3 is pinned. So that being said, I am going to go right back to the e4 square, attack the knight that's pinned. White probably has to play the move rook to c1 to protect the knight. And then we're just going to look to trade pieces. We are up a full piece in material here. We have two bishops compared to our opponent's one bishop. And so uh, we also have a pair of knights for both players. So we are up a bishop in this position with a pretty substantial advantage here. So in this particular game, our opponent kind of just ends up getting themselves into trouble because of the uh, uh, because of the early mistakes in the opening phase. I think it was really this bishop g5 and then queen to d2 problem that they ran into. So uh, I, I don't even really need to make this trade yet since the knight is still pinned, but I'm going to do it anyways. I'm just going to keep it simple. Let's take the knight, they take back. I have to move the bishop away. Let's just go back to e7, just pick a safe and solid location. They play bishop to d3. I'm going to go for knight to c6, put the bishop on the b7 square, b6, bishop to b7. Very safe and solid. Uh, we could also go knight to e4, uh, excuse me, knight to e5 at the right time to attack the bishop as well as the pawn. Um, bishop a6 is also good to attack the front of the uh, double pawns that white has. Maybe, maybe we'll start with that move. And yeah, white's just in a lot of trouble here. Knight to e5, attacking the bishop and the pawn is a big threat. Uh, the rook going to the c file, going after the c pawn is also an idea. And yeah, they're down a piece, most likely going to lose uh, further material from here. So let's go knight to e5, hit the bishop, hit the pawn. If they move the bishop away, they are attacking a rook. Very important that we don't just rush to grab the c4 pawn that they are left uh, undefended and lose the rook in the corner. That'd be very bad. So we move the rook to safety, continue piling up on the pawn, and simply put, there's no way for white to protect this pawn uh, enough times to not lose it here. So we are going to be ahead a piece and a pawn here. Let's go ahead and take with our knight. We're also attacking the pawn on the e3 square. So they do retreat the bishop to d3. It does end up that our knight is pinned in this position. Um, but we don't really need to move it anytime soon. Uh, I think I'm just going to go for the move pawn to d5, just to gain a little more space, secure the knight. Probably uh, probably we'll just castle the king pretty soon. Um, and even though they are attacking our knight on c4 that is currently pinned, um, I don't think this is a problem for us, because now there is a difference. I can take the knight on d2. It does look like they can take me on a6, but I'm also attacking the rook that's on the b1 square. So this actually allows me to unpin my piece by capturing something. They get my bishop, I get their rook, they get my rook, I take their pawn, and really we're just like Pac-Man jumping all around, attacking a bunch of pieces. I could take the a2 pawn, but it is even better to give the check on e2, pick up the rook on c1, and yeah, we're just up a knight, a rook, a couple pawns, very big material advantage, and white is, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if white ended up resigning in a position like this. So uh, if, if they don't, we're just going to go ahead and take the a2 pawn and then really just push the a and b pawns up the board. As we've talked about in other positions and other games, when you have a material advantage, you can use the material advantage to start to attack the opponent. Uh, you want to still think about trading pieces. But what I generally like to do, especially in the end game phase, is I like to grab some pawns and then push my own pawns down the board, try to promote to a queen, and uh, that usually is a pretty safe and solid way of converting a material advantage. Okay, looks like our opponent uh, has lost the game here. So let's go ahead and backtrack. In terms of the opening phase, they start off with d4, knight f6, c4, c5. Uh, d5 is the most critical and kind of objectively best move in the position for our opponent. And if they had done d5, we would have gone for the move b5 for our bingo gambit. Instead, though, this opponent plays the move knight f3, which is a very solid uh, sideline option, you could call it. What I recommend, as I said during the game, is I like taking the pawn on d4 and then playing the move e6. And 
the general plan here is to play the move pawn to d5 uh, against most moves that white can try. For example, if they play something like knight to c3, I recommend just going pawn to d5 right away. If they take, we take with the knight. If they trade, we take with the queen. And now we have ideas like bishop to b4 check, pawn to e5. If the knight moves away, we'll trade the queens. And black, I think, is doing totally fine in a position like this. If black doesn't trade, uh, sorry, if white doesn't trade the knights, they might play something like bishop b2 to guard the knight. They might play queen b3. There's different moves white can try in this position. Um, but suffice it to say that black is very solid and doing totally fine at this point. Um, if they played a move like g3, I would also still play d5, for example. If they take the pawn, queen takes. This already gets kind of annoying for our opponent, and I think black is already a little bit better. So white has to be a bit careful in this kind of position. Uh, they played this move bishop g5. We went for this queen a5 check, and I really think that white simply has to bring the bishop back to the d2 square. And against that, I would have probably played queen to b6. This was the move I was leaning towards. Attack the pawn on b2 and the knight on d4 at the same time. I would assume white plays either bishop c1 or bishop c3. These are the ways of kind of defending both pieces simultaneously. And probably from here, I might consider the move knight to e4 and take the bishop. That way I can gain the pair of bishops, and that would be something I can kind of work with as the game goes on. Uh, if white plays bishop back to c1 instead, maybe here I go bishop c5 and start to create some threats. Something like this might have, you know, been, it would have definitely been a more solid way of playing uh, compared to what our opponent did in the game. The queen to d2 move simply gets them into very big trouble because we have this pin with the bishop, and then we play this move knight to e4, which just attacks pretty much everything in white's position, and there's really just no way for them to avoid losing material. If they had moved the queen away, uh, I probably would have just, uh, I could take the bishop if I want. I can also take this knight first, and then something like this looks pretty good. Objectively speaking, though, it's probably best just to take the knight, or sorry, just to take the bishop, and we're up a piece, we're in good shape. Even if white tries h4 trying to trap the knight, because technically it has no safe squares, we can actually just go right back to the e4 square, and if the queen takes the knight, we take on c3, and white is losing, you know, more and more material here. So they tried this move, queen b3, we took the bishop, we're up a piece, we traded more stuff, and then the rest of the game was really just about getting the, uh, our pieces further into the game, targeting the weakness on the c4 square, trading more pieces, trade, 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 and then a final fork, which ends the game. So that's it for this game. Let's go ahead and get into our next one. All right, next game. Our opponent plays d4. We go knight f6, of course. This, uh, this particular opponent has the name 123gtendra456 from uh, from India. And okay, so d4, knight f6, they go for the move knight to c3. As I've mentioned in some of the previous episodes, we're generally playing the move pawn to c5 on the second move of the game, but we're only uh, holding off on that, I would say, unless... Uh, if our opponent is trying to put a pawn on e4 on the third move of the game. So right now, if we played the move pawn to c5, white could play d5 and then e4, and they get two pawns in the center, and we really don't want to allow that too easily. So what I recommend against knight c3 is to go for the move pawn to d5. Uh, we are just equalizing the space in the center of the board, and we're preventing our opponent from pushing that pawn up to e4 square. Now, as soon as I say that, they end up pushing the pawn to e4 anyways. So with that being said, uh, this is a gambit uh, move option. Uh, this is what's known as the Black Mar Deemer Gambit. Uh, the way that I recommend playing against this is just going ahead and taking the pawn on e4. You can use the knight or the pawn. I think taking with the pawn is uh, simple enough. What white will usually do is play the move f3 in order to kind of, you could say, like confirm the gambit. Um, and there's a couple of options that are available here. Uh, I recommend, generally speaking, taking the pawn and playing the positions that arise. Uh, I think that they are positions that are better for black, objectively speaking, as long as black knows what they're doing. That being said, there could be some complications as the game continues. If you don't really like being behind on development and being attacked, even if you are ahead material, then you could very well just play a move like pawn to e3, let the opponent recapture the pawn, uh, and don't let them develop the knight to the f3 square. It is going to be a position that's a little bit better for white if you do play e3, 
Um, whereas if you take the pawn on f3, black is the one that's a bit better. So that being said, I am going to accept the gambit. Uh, it's also possible to play a move like bishop f5 to guard the pawn, but then there's ideas like g4 that white can try, and it gets a little messy if you're not careful once again. Okay, so what I recommend doing against this, I uh, white has recaptured with the knight on f3. I think we can just go ahead and develop the bishop. And we want to develop the bishop to the f5 square, and then play the move e6, develop the rest of our uh, king side, and look to essentially utilize our extra pawn as the game goes on. So let's go for the move e6. Uh, I do want to point out e6 first is fine to play if you want to develop the king side a little bit quicker, but it has the drawback of the bishop on c8 being blocked in. In this particular case, though, we're able to um, get the bishop developed out to the f5 square first and then play the move e6, which is a little bit of a better version of things because the bishop is not blocked behind the pawn. So white goes for the move d5. Uh, which is an interesting option here. Um, against this move, we probably have a couple of options. We could go ahead and trade uh, pawns in the center of the board. Uh, though I'm not super crazy about white being able to open up the middle of the board with elite in development. They can cast a little bit quicker than we can. So I'm a little bit bothered by that. I think what I'm going to go for here, rather than trading pawns, and you know, if I trade knights, they take with the bishop, and the bishop's active, there's bishop takes b7 ideas, and even bishop takes f7 tricks that white can try, uh, stuff like that we have to be a bit careful about. I think instead of that, I'm going to actually just develop the dark square bishop. And my goal is to get, eliminate the knight on c3, and then once the knight's gone, I can take the pawn on d5 easier. Also, if they take my pawn on e6, I do have this supported adequately here. And I would also be able to trade the queens. And I think if we can trade the queens, life gets a bit simpler when you're ahead material with the queens coming off the board. So white tries to move a3. They are attacking the bishop. But part of our idea with bishop to b4 was to take the knight anyways. So we're going to take the knight on c3. And now that the knight is off of the board, that means that the pawn on d5 is less protected. And now we are able to take it with our knight or with our pawn. I'm not entirely sure which one we should capture with. Um, I'm leaning towards the pawn, mainly because it makes a threat and forces white to react. Whereas taking with the knight, they maybe have a free move to do something that could be a little bit annoying. So I'm going to take with the pawn. We are attacking the bishop in this position. If they go back to d3, we'll probably just trade pieces. If they retreat the bishop to b3, as they are doing here... Um, I am very well might just throw in this move queen to e7 check. This is a check that's not super easy for white to deal with, I will say. Uh, if they block with the queen, we're very happy to trade the queens when we're up two pawns. If they move the king uh, to f2, there might be some knight g4 checks or knight e4 checks that are pretty dangerous for them. And if they move the king to f1, then they're not going to be able to castle anymore, and I think we've got a very solid position. Um, I think castling right away is also absolutely fine, but I like this idea of throwing in a check, making it so that white has a harder time castling the king, their own king themselves. And then we can solidify our center, castle ourselves, and try to uh, play from there. Now, we have to be a little bit careful. Rook to e1 right now would be at least somewhat annoying. Uh, so for that reason, we can either play knight e4 check or knight g4 check. Even queen to c5 check is possible. I'm leaning towards knight e4 check just to get the knight in the center of the board. I think it's very active there. Uh, knight g4 check looks good. I mean, there, there's no reason it's not good. Let's put it that way. I mean, they could play king g3 and then rook e1. But I, I'm going to go for knight e4 check. I think it's nice to just keep the knight centralized. If the king moves to the e file, there's going to be a variety of different discovered checks available. Uh, probably the king should go to f1. But then once again, the rook in the corner is blocked out when the king is on the f1 square. If they go to g1, they always have to be a little bit careful about some kind of queen c5 check. So they do go to f1. They keep the king safe. Uh, now I do have to be a little bit careful about them attacking the pawn on d5. I could take the pawn on c3, which I think is totally fine and playable. Uh, but quite honestly, I think I'm just going to... Uh, I'm a little bit bothered by something like knight takes c3 and then queen to d4 and the knight's hit and the pawn's hit. And I'm behind on development. 
actually, I'm really not behind on development. Uh, but I, my pieces get kicked around. I'm already up two pawns. I don't really need to do anything super fancy to maintain the advantage. I'm just going to go for c6, get the king castled. Once I'm castled, then I can start, you know, doing some fancy stuff. And I'm already ahead two pawns. I don't really need to do anything uh, crazy in this position to have a very good uh, situation. So he plays pawn to c4. I think here uh, I'll probably just go ahead and trade the pawns. There's probably other moves that are good too, but let's just take the pawn and then we'll castle and then we'll just play with our two extra pawns in a good position. Queen e2 is, uh, sorry, queen c5 is also a possibility to threaten mate as well as the bishop. Probably white plays queen e2 to guard both things, so I don't think that does a whole lot for us right away. I think I'm just going to castle and put the rook on the open file, develop the rest of my pieces. Again, I'm up two pawns. Things are looking good. Uh, I think we can just play uh, a bit more simply here. So white plays bishop to b2. Uh, queen to c5 is still looking pretty good, but I think I'm going to throw in... Um, if I put this rook on d8, then the other rook feels a little bit blocked. I think I'm just going to develop the knight here. Yeah, let's just go knight to d7. There's many different moves that are probably very good in these positions. I'm just going to play solidly. I'm up two pawns. No need to go super fancy. Just going to develop the knight, put the two rooks in the center, and be in very good shape. So white plays knight to d4. They are attacking my bishop on f5. Uh, I think the simplest thing is just to retreat the bishop to safety. Queen to f6 is also quite annoying for our opponent because it lines up towards the king and kind of pins the knight on d4 simultaneously. Objectively speaking, that's probably our best move, in my opinion. Um, bishop g6, I think, is absolutely good and solid and safe as well. I'm going to go for queen f6. I don't see a reason not to try this. If he plays queen f3, I have the move knight to d2 check, forking the king and the queen. So they have to be careful about this lineup. This is pinned. Even though, they, you know, if they move the knight away, my queen is being attacked by the bishop, but the bishop's not protected. So there's not really a... It's not really a great way to move the knight and make a threat when their bishop is undefended. So right now the main threat is to play something like bishop to g4, make a check, hit the queen. Something like that looks pretty good. Alternatively, if white... Okay, they do move the queen to f3. This does block off the, uh, the file. It does also attack my bishop, but it gives up this check on d2, which attacks a bunch of white's pieces. We take the queen next move. And we're just going to be ahead a ton of material with a winning position uh, at this point. We can also play pawn to c5 and attack the bishop that's pinned. Uh, or, sorry, attack the knight that's pinned. Um, I think I'll just drop the bishop back to safety first. And then pawn to c5, knight to e5. These moves are all uh, kind of annoying for the opponent to deal with. So they do play rook to b1. They are guarding the bishop, so they want to move the knight to safety uh, and then attack my queen. I'm going to go for the move knight to e5. This attacks the bishop. This attacks the pawn. Uh, and then next move, I'll kick the knight. And yeah, we're just pushing white's pieces backwards. They move the rook here to attack the knight. However, this does allow me to capture the bishop on c4 for free. And we're also attacking the bishop on b2. So even if the knight moves away somewhere, I can just take the bishop with the knight in this position. So interesting here that our opponent in the opening plays a gambit uh, gambit opening. Uh, we were the ones trying to go for the bingo gambit. They end up going for this Blackmar Deemer gambit. Uh, but you could kind of ask the question, who's attacking who <laughs> in this uh, in this kind of position here? Like clearly we're the ones that were attacking white. I think white definitely misplayed the opening themselves. And that's where they get themselves into a lot of trouble. So they're down a, uh, a minor piece and a queen and two pawns. Yeah, we're, we're just way, way ahead at this point. And it's all about just grabbing more stuff. Take this pawn, give this check on d3 when the pawn's gone, centralize the rooks. And yeah, white's in, uh, white's in very bad shape here. He takes the knight. We can just take back. Now we're up a queen and a rook. And I'll just go ahead and play this move rook to e8 to pin the knight here. And we are very happy to trade rooks. He has to recapture. Now we have this move queen to c1 check, just little simple tactics, forking an undefended piece and the king at the same time. We take the knight, 
We're going to bring the rook over and we're going to deliver checkmate in just a couple of moves. Okay, our opponent ends up resigning here and we get the job done. So let's go back through the opening phase. In the opening, it starts off with uh, d4, knight f6, knight c3. As I mentioned during the game, and as I've mentioned in other episodes of the speedrun series, when our opponent is not playing, uh, well, pretty much even if they are playing c4, we're usually looking to play the move pawn to c5 in the opening phase on the second move of the game in the large majority of situations. However, if our opponent is threatening to play the move e4, so if they play knight c3 or f3 or queen d3, all three of these moves kind of set up the idea of putting the pawn on the e4 square. Against all three of these moves, I'm going to generally recommend just playing the move pawn to d5. All three of these moves have drawbacks in some ways. And even if you're stepping a little bit out of the normal bingo gambit territory, um, stopping the opponent from getting two pawns in the center of the board is usually worth it. And also, like, f3 is not a great move. It blocks in the knight on g1. Queen d3 is a little bit awkward. Knight c3 is a perfectly fine move, but it does have some slight, uh, sl slight drawbacks of blocking the c2 pawn. So that being said, uh, after knight c3, we went d5. Uh, the main move here, in my opinion, is for players to go for the move bishop f4, which is the Jabal Ludman system. Uh, if they had done this, I would then play the move pawn to c5. This is my recommendation here. But if they don't play, uh, play this in the game, they went for this move e4, which is a gambit that they're going for themselves. We take the pawn, they offer another pawn, we take that one. And I like this idea of developing the bishop to the f5 square before playing the move e6. You could also play e6, it's very solid and safe, uh, but the downside is your bishop on c8 gets blocked in by the pawn. So I like getting the bishop in the game first, then playing the move e6. And I think this d5 move is just really not that good. It's, it's a bit too early for white to try to open up the center of the board before they're castled. Uh, the most common move for white is usually to play the move castles right away. And then black has a couple of options here. You can go c6 to stop the move d5. You can develop the bishop. Uh, one common way white can try to do some tactics is something like knight to g5, I believe. And now they have ideas here of like taking the pawn, taking the bishop, and trying to break through this diagonal. Like Just as an example, if you play a move like c6, this is a huge mistake. Here white can... Uh, I, think they take the bishop first, then they take the pawn, they fork the queen and the rook, and then they take the rook, and now white's just up a piece with a great position, which is very bad for us, of course. What you want to do against this knight g5 move, you just want to castle the king, I think. Uh, if they take on f7 now, you have the rook that's protecting it. If they try to take the bishop first and then the pawn, the rook is still there guarding the f7 pawn. And for the most part, black is just up a pawn uh, with a better position. You could also play bishop to g6. This is also available as well, just to guard the f7 pawn. Um, but white has some compensation, but it's usually not enough to make up for the pawn deficit, I would say. The move d5 in the game, I went for this pin with the bishop. There might be other moves that are also fine to go for, uh, but the way it worked out is we took the knight, we took another pawn, we checked, checked, and... It ends up that, you know, our king is the one that gets safe, our opponent is the king, has the king who is unsafe, and we're also ahead two pawns at the same time. So with that being said, I just develop more pieces, lined up towards the king. Uh, if they do take my bishop on f5, I was probably just going to take back with the queen and try to invade uh, if the king moves away. And once again, if they block with the queen on f3, I have this four, which is uh, working out very nicely for us. In the game, they moved the queen first. We made the check, took the queen, and then, you know, just attacked and took more pieces. And then we were just ahead, you know, way too much material, and our opponent ended up uh, resigning. So anyways, though, that's it for our second game. Let's go ahead and get into the third one. All right, so we've got our third game. Playing against uh, Saeed Merad 1992S, I think, is how you might say that name, from the United Kingdom. So they start off with d4, we go knight f6, they go for the London system with the move bishop to f4. Against this, I recommend going for the move c5 to strike at the opponent's center right away. And in this case, white decides to capture the pawn on the c5 square. Now against this capture on c5, uh, what I recommend here, there's, there's many different options, I will say first of all, and how you're going to be able to win the pawn back. Queen a5 check is a pretty straightforward option, which forks the king as well as the pawn at the same time. 
knight to a6 attacks the pawn, pawn to e6 attacks the pawn. I recommend the move pawn to e6 in this kind of position. Uh, this is what we're going to go for. And so we open up the bishop to attack the pawn on c5. If white plays the move b4, we'll probably go for a5 to chip away at the pawn. Uh, if white goes for bishop to d6, which they didn't go for in the game, but if they had played the move bishop to d6, then we would go ahead and exchange the bishops. If the pawn takes back, we will usually be able to win the pawn on d6 at some point because it's very far on our half of the board. Queen to b6 followed by knight to e4 is one way of winning the pawn. And instead, after bishop d6 and the trade, if the queen ends up taking back, uh, then we're able to play a move like knight to e4 and then queen to a5 check. So you're pretty much able to get the pawn back even if the pair of bishops get traded. In this case, though, white goes for the move knight to c3. Let's go ahead and capture the pawn on the c5 square. And so we've gotten our pawn back. We are uh, having two pawns in the center of the board now compared to our opponent's one pawn in the center of the board. And uh, our opponent is continuing to develop. They play the move knight to f3. I think I might be able to get away with queen to b6 here, attacking both the f2 pawn as well as the b2 pawn. Uh, there is some risk associated with going for this, I will say. Um, so I'm not actually going to go for this move, but I do think it may work out. I think in this particular case, though, especially for the purposes of this kind of playthrough in the video, uh, I'm going to probably just play in a more solid way to begin with here. So I'm just going to go ahead and play the move. Uh, I'm just going to go for the move pawn to d5. We gain space in the center. Probably we're going to castle next move. Uh, okay, they play pawn to e3. I think we are going to go ahead and we're going to castle the king. Get the king to safety. And then look to develop the knight. Develop the king side. Uh, let's say here knight to c6, for example. And again, we have a little bit of a preferable position. Um, objectively, it's probably pretty equal, but I tend to like black's chances here because of the extra space in the center of the board and the fact that we have two pawns compared to our opponent's one. So here we have a couple of options. Um, I would generally like to play the move pawn to e5 at some point so that I can get two pawns controlling the center of the board instead of just the one that I have on the d5 square. Of course, if we go pawn to e5 right away, white's just going to take the pawn since they have enough coverage on that e5 square. So what I'm going to do is play the move rook to e8. And my idea is to play the move pawn to e5 and look to attack the bishop. And even after the bishop ends up moving, then I can even push the pawn further up to the e4 square where I will be attacking both the uh, bishop on d3 and the knight on f3. So white played the move pawn to h3. Uh, this doesn't really address our idea of pushing the pawn up the board as a bit of a bulldozer. Uh, I think a better move for white would have been knight to e5. Sorry, knight to e5 blocking the pawn. I think that would have been a solid approach that was available for them. When they play pawn to h3 though, I think they're doing this in order to give the bishop some escape squares. But the problem is, after we push the pawn, even if the bishop does retreat, uh, he decides to go for the pin, uh, we can still push the pawn all the way up to the e4 square, and we're going to be able to uh, win material because of this. So the pin here we have to be a little bit careful about, but I do think we are still able to push the pawn up the board. If white does capture the knight, here we have a very interesting choice and decision that we have to make. Do we recapture the bishop with the queen or recapture with the pawn? Uh, in this particular case, uh, as far as I am aware at this point, I think it's actually a lot better to capture with the pawn. It might seem very counterproductive to take with the pawn. You might think, well, okay, of course I should take with the queen. If I take with the pawn, you know, then I'm going to be messing up the king protection and my pawns are doubled, my pawn structure is bad. Uh, but if we take with the queen, it's very important when you are calculating, considering what moves you're going to be playing in certain positions, you always have to consider what the opponent can do in response to your moves. If we take with the queen, there is at least this possibility for white to play the move knight takes d5. I don't necessarily think that this solves all of their problems, I will say, uh, mainly because even after we move the queen away from the knight's attack, we are still forking the two pieces on f3 and d3. I think we would actually still end up being ahead material. But white does at least get to grab this pawn, and maybe he's, aside from hitting the queen, he's also maybe jumping to c7 to fork the pieces. I think we would still be fine in that case. 
but I actually like this option of recapturing with the pawn a little bit more, I believe, because we don't, uh, once white, you know, has a choice of moves, they can't take the pawn on d5 this time because our queen protects it. So if they can't take the pawn, they're going to have to move the bishop or the knight backwards. And once they do that, then we're going to be able to take the, the other piece and be ahead material without having lost our pawn on d5. So I have a feeling that the computer may not necessarily have a huge preference either way. Um, but I'm taking with the pawn. We can check it afterwards and see what, uh, what the case is. So they end up taking on d5 here uh, anyways. And this is kind of what I was trying to kind of fight against by taking with the pawn. Uh, so here we have the option of which piece to capture. They can take either one of the knights. They can take the bishop on d3 as well. It's going to be, I think, a lot better here to take the knight on d5, not only because it gets rid of a piece that's in the center, but also because after we take this knight on d5, white is still left over with two other pieces that are being attacked in the position. And so other than winning the knight, we're also winning an extra piece on top of it. So here white takes with the bishop on e4. Uh, we have, you know, two different options. We can either take with our queen or trade queens first. You do not want to take with the rook and lose your queen on d5. That would be very bad. I'm just going to go ahead and take with the queen. Uh, I do think trading queens and then taking would have also been fine. But if we had taken the queen, maybe white would have been able to throw in the move. Bishop takes h7 check and kind of kamikaze the, the bishop for a little bit of extra material. That being said, they, re they retreat their knight. So we are simply ahead two pieces. We're ahead two bishops in this position. White does have two extra pawns, but two pieces is definitely a large advantage. So I'm going to play the move bishop f5 and to get this a little bit closer to protecting my king. That's part of the idea. But also at the same time, I'm attacking the pawn on c2, which white might have to be a bit careful about. They move the knight to the g4 square. Their threat is to take the pawn on f6 and make a royal or family fork attacking all of the heavy pieces and the king in this position. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm just going to take the knight. We're ahead two pieces. We simply want to trade stuff. We can also trade the queens in this position, which is nice. Now we can bring our final piece into the game and get on the open file. And simply put, we're ahead two minor pieces with a very large advantage. So I'm just going to continue trading pieces. Let's trade a pair of rooks. Let's also challenge our opponent for the control of the open file. They're pretty accommodating here. They're just kind of trading everything, uh, which I'm pretty happy about. I'm going to now move the king up the board and try to uh, activate the king. Uh, I'm going to play the move, let's say, knight to c6, just kind of developing a little further. Now we have the move knight to e5, delivering a check, as well as attacking the pawn that's on the g4 square. We will pick up that pawn now. And we're just going to use the bishop and the knight to jump around and grab all the free material. The bishop can retreat. I'm not sure if it matters where. Let's go back here. Uh, now, I don't have a pass pawn just yet. If I did have a pass pawn, that would be my main game plan would be to simply push that pawn up the board and just try to uh, promote it to a queen. Right now, there's no pass pawn because every one of my pawns either has a pawn in front of it uh, or has a pawn on a, an adjacent file. For example, this pawn on g2 kind of stops me from running my h-pawn up the board. Even though it's not in front of the pawn, it is controlling one of the squares in front of the pawn. If the pawn on g2 was gone, if I had already won this pawn, for example, then I think I would just be shooting the h-pawn up the board to win the game. Uh, but here I'm going to just utilize the pieces to start attacking white's pawns. We're just going to jump around, create threats, attack this pawn. Let's move this bishop backwards just to freeze both of these pawns from moving easily. Now we'll move the knight back and attack this pawn. And then just take this pawn, go after the other pawns, and do things like that. So check here. Take this pawn. Even if I end up losing one of my pieces, as long as I'm able to get rid of a ton of the pawns that the opponent has, that's going to be good enough. Now I'm ahead uh, one pawn and two minor pieces, and I can start trying to use the extra pawn that I have to push up the board. So. They end up resigning. That's the end of the game. Let's go ahead and go back through it and analyze things. So it starts off again with d4, knight f6. They go for a London system type of setup, and they end up capturing the pawn on the c5 square. So as I mentioned during the game, against this, I recommend the move pawn to e6. And I think that white played in a very uh, normal type of way of playing in the opening phase. I think knight c3 and knight f3 are perfectly fine and solid moves. 
Um, if White wanted to be a little bit more uh, ambitious or a little bit more proactive, you could say, they could have tried to move like bishop to d6 or pawn to b4 or different ways of trying to hold on to the c5 pawn. They tend to not work out that great. I think bishop d6, we would trade the bishops. If the queen takes, there's knight to e4 uh, or maybe even knight to a6. Uh, I know that this position's in, the, <laughs> in my chessable course. I kind of forget... I slightly forget the move order here. I think it's knight a6 and then queen e7, maybe. Um, but we're going to end up winning the pawn back on c5 pretty easily. It's kind of hard for white to avoid losing it. We'll take the pawn on c5 next. And if they take back with the pawn instead, then, uh, then we play queen to b6, and white has a hard time defending all of the weaknesses in their position. So they're usually going to lose that pawn back anyways. Um, in the game, they developed both of their knights. I played the move d5. I had a feeling that queen to b6 might have been a better way of doing things, and I do think in hindsight this would have actually been a little bit of a stronger move, but it also requires some risk. It, it, it does take some, uh, you could call it some guts, so to speak, to go for this move, because even if white defends against the attack on the f2 pawn and we take here, after something like knight to b5, you have to still be quite careful in a position like this. White's threatening the fork on c7, white's threatening... Uh, knight to d6 check, bishop to d6. We're up a pawn, but we're kind of in some danger here. I decided not to go for this option. I decided it was a little bit too risky. I just prioritized central play and castling and developing instead. So d5, we castle, develop, rook to e8. My idea was to push the pawn up the board in the center. And as you saw in the game, white didn't stop that, and thus we got a big advantage. I do think white's best move here is probably just to put the knight in the middle of the board. This looks relatively safe. Um, another option is to play pawn to e4 themselves, kind of beating us to the punch and not letting us get our pawn all the way up to the e4 square. But uh, in the game, they played the move h3. We do push forward. We push again. They take the knight. I took with the pawn. Uh, if we take with the queen, the computer also says that this is very good for black as well. If they take the pawn, you retreat. There's too many pieces that are being attacked at the same time. There's no way white can defend all three pieces. So this would have also been very good for black too. Taking with the pawn, I think, is a little bit simpler. He ended up losing an extra piece. And then we were up two pieces. We traded material, traded rooks, traded rooks, and then just used our bishop and knight to eventually jump around and capture a bunch of pawns. And that got us the win at the end of the day. All right, so that's it for these three games. Hopefully you enjoyed this episode. I will see you in the next video in the episode series in order to uh, play against players in the 1200 to 1300 rating range. And so we'll see how those games go. See you in the next video.